Well, and the other thing, I mean, I found it a really fascinating play because it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to watch because you never get to see her face. Um, and it's, and that's a challenge for the actors, too. And Jevo performed in it, so that was interesting to watch as well. But, but for me, too, it's like seeing the film No, which is about how Chile's equivalent of Madison Avenue helped participate in the plebiscite and get people to vote no against the dictatorship. Um, and in the film, I don't know how many people have seen the film. You should see it. It's a really interesting film. But it's, it's presented as if there are two options. There's dictatorship or democracy, as democracy is understood by Augusto Pinochet and company. And what, the, what your play did is it made me remember that the, we don't only have two options. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have to come from the political class or the military class. There are other possibilities. And so often, you know, I, I process through my experience with Argentina, is the idea of, oh, we have dictatorship or democracy. Those are the two options. And obviously, the opposite of dictatorship is democracy in a, a certain kind of democracy. And in the Chilean case, the tradition of democracy, so this idea of returning to the democracy we used to have, he said, maybe, could we maybe think of another country, yeah. you know, and, and not returning to democracy, which is yeah. as we always put it, right? Yeah. Redemocratizing. Yeah. And I felt that your, your play really kind of brought that up for me and right. really productive and uncomfortable. I thought it was a really uncomfortable play, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so moving along a little bit, are there two more plays that I want to get to? We're, we'll end with Neva, the one, so you can leave with the one that you, I hope you get to see. Um, the, uh, the next to most recent play uh, is Beven, Quake, which was commissioned by and staged last year in Germany. It was commissioned by the Schauspiel Dusseldorf, so staged in Dusseldorf, Germany. And it's set in the aftermath of 2010's earthquake in Chile, hence the title. Um, you have four, they're not Chileans, four German disaster relief volunteers who are at their base camp in Chile. And what we see, we see examples of compassion fatigue. Some of them have been in post-tsunami Indonesia, other parts of the world, and are just basically worn out, but still working for the NGO. But we also see conflicting motives. And some of them are really questionable motives, as well as really clear traces of European colonialism regarding Latin America. We're going to come and help you poor people. Um, and I'm fascinated by the idea of a German audience seeing this play. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what's at the core of this play? It's such a different play from your other plays, I think. And I wondered also, how did the German audience react to seeing their compatriots represented not as very heroic? I think they're used to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I have to say that uh, it was a it was a great experience. I wanted they they asked me to uh, create a, a play uh, that sort of highlighted the relationship between my country and theirs. Okay. So that's the reason I chose the subject. But I wanted to address the problem problem of the earth, earthquake because when uh, such a thing happens, as you know, uh, sort of uh, some uh, truths emerge about the country. So in the case of uh, my country was looting. Mm -hmm. And not only looting, but also people um, defending the neighborhoods with, uh, with weapons and closing off streets and, and um, uh, sort of uh, uh, putting barriers against the, the crazy poor who are going to be taking over the rich neighborhoods. And that's, um, that was um, really, really interesting because it was a moment of truth for a country. Because uh, it's a very violent country, and a, and a country that never um, never experienced uh, truth and justice uh, after the dictatorship was over. So there's a lot of uh, resentment and a lot of uh, violence. But, the, but, but when you go to the country, you see a mostly um, peaceful country. But you need an earthquake for the two energies that are underneath <laughs> everything to just uh, come out. Come out. Yeah. So that was the point of the, of the, of the play. And, and at the end, the Germans uh, uh, joined the looting. Uh, that's sort of a... Right, right. But you see the Chilean truth coming out in yes. the reactions of the German yeah. relief workers. Yeah. And so we're going to come to the first play, Neva, leaving the first for last. And 
Guillermo and I have talked about in Argentina so often, the theater dealing with really similar issues. There's shared issues that I think you deal with in your plays. But often, uh, Argentine theater takes the family as the stand-in, the microcosmic stand-in for the nation. So you have a lot of family plays in Argentina. Guillermo's plays, on the other hand, really range broadly. And with the exception of Diciembre, uh, they've taken, they take place in institutional sites, I guess I'd say. The classroom, a meeting hall, a public presidential address, which may be in uh, a building or to the cameras, to the television, um, the congressional building, an NGO base camp. Neva takes place in a rehearsal room of an amateur theater company in 1905 St. Petersburg. Anton Chekhov, sounds very different from everything else, right? Anton Chekhov's widow, wife, and leading actress, who's also German, Olga Knipper, is waiting there with two of the local actors. She's the vis visiting artist, right? Waiting with two local actors for the rest of the company to show up. They never show up because they're caught up in what's happening outside on the streets, which is the Bloody Sunday Massacre. Um, and it clearly establishes the theater as a place of encounter, as a crossroads, a meeting place, a place where the personal and the public spheres can intersect and fight. How does, it, how does this play, Neva, fit into your view that theater is a battle, battlefield? What does it say about the purpose of theater? Um, basically, it's a, well, it's a confrontation between the the studio where you rehearse and the outside, the reality, especially when it's a reality of political violence. So there's a battle between uh, what we want to do, the artistic sort of endeavor, with um, what is meaningful outside and what is urgent. And uh, for, for me, it was, um, I, I said this, this before, I, I wrote the play during the, the worst years of uh, the Iraq war, mm -hmm. in which you were reading the news about Oh, 300 people died today at that market. Oh no, maybe 200 died in a uh, sort of a bombing raid or something. And of course, it's really, really, really hard to rehearse and concentrate on something, on a piece of um, theatrical beauty when you are uh, living that reality, even if it's not right outside the theater, but right. in the world. And since the world is so small, it might as well be outside. So that relationship between reality and theater and art in general that's, the, that's one of the battlefields, the main battlefields of the theater. Which, uh, it's an it's a unsolved problem and it's an ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. If, if you read the review of the, of the show in the New York Times, the critic took Guillermo, a question made by Guillermo as rhetorical when it really is not. And so I want to put the question to you. What's the point of seeing a theatrical work when, because of politics, people are dying every day? What's the point? Yeah, what's the point? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's almost pointless. So uh, I think I belong to an elite. And I, and I cater to that elite. <laughs> I don't uh, dislike that elite because I belong to that elite, but I think that that elite has a lot of responsibility. So I think that my political theater is, uh, I, usually, I, I usually say, able to start a conversation or, or motivate a, a sort of a, a, I don't know, the, the engagement of, of ideas. Uh, that are going to eventually spread out. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little spark. Mm -hmm. um, in that way, it's meaningful. Uh, I, I, uh, I love theater, and I think it's my, my, my only uh, religion, okay. if I can say that, because it's the only time I actually see other people, because I'm pretty much all that day at home just trying to write. So it's the only the only place where I gather with other people in order to think collect, collectively about something. 
And that is very political because I live my political life by myself in front of a computer. So my political life in the theater becomes, if for an hour or two, uh, something collective. So um, I love to think that I create that sort of um, space, collective space. So um, in that way, it's meaningful. And the other, the other way in that it can be meaningful is that it creates the, uh, it's um, stimulating or uh, encouraging for the already convinced. Uh, so I don't want, if I go to see a political play, I don't, maybe not, I'm not going to be discovering new ideas, but I'm going to be reinforcing the ideas that I already have. And that's something I need, because I always feel I am in the minority. So I need a sense of belonging. Uh, and that I like to create myself when I create theater. Okay. And um, also, it's a good sort of a, a good second option for not being outside marching, joining the students. It's a good second uh, sort of a uh, sim sim simulac simulacrum, mm -hmm. of yeah. simulacrum for, for what is the real engagement in mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. activities. Yeah. Okay, great. I think, um, I think that's a good place for us to stop great. and to open it up to everyone else here. So questions, comments? Yeah, Seth. Just quickly follow up on this. Uh, idea of not being in the streets but still doing something. I'm just, I know I'm saying it differently. I, I remember that Stanislavski wrote about the, 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 the Bloody Sunday and he said that theater artists should avoid attaching themselves to what he called a tendency and what we might call a movement, but that didn't necessarily mean that the work that the theater people were doing was of no value. In fact, I think he thought it was of greater value than marching in the streets. And I think that you know when you talk about being a member of elite, an elite, uh, there are some elites I want to belong to, and uh, some I don't. But I think that if we, you know, we can, uh, as I said, to follow up, that, that, that you know there may be something that's more powerful than marching in the streets for a day if it lasts for 10 years or 20 or a couple of lifetimes. So I certainly want to support what I'm getting from the conversation with that thing from Stanislaus. Yeah. Although I would have to say, in Neva, you're a little rough on Stanislavski. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, so when I see theater, I, I see theater as a way of thinking. Because when ideas are on stage, there is a, a new understanding of those ideas. Or, or, or maybe if I can say it in another way, the ideas that are presented on stage, you can only understand them if they are set on stage. I don't know if I'm making any sense. So in that way, um, theater can, it's very, it's very, um, uh, valid occurrence because it allows uh, for a new understanding of a more deep understanding of a more creative understanding of what is going on in the world. The only problem is that it's uh, for uh, the privileged, but um, I think it's definitely a, a valid uh, endeavor. There's something, there's something that sort of a, I'm not completely comfortable with when theater is only about beauty, and that sort of it's a, it's a disappointing one here, yeah. unfulfilling. Mm -hmm. But now, when you did the performances of Disha, yeah. Discurso, were those free that you did in the different centers, or were, did you charge admission? No, we charge admission, yes. Okay. Yes. $15. Yeah. Um, I was struck. I um, am only familiar with Neva, but I was struck with the discussion of Lisha, speech, to sin, Bray, um, and Neva, the role of women in the revolution. I was wondering if you might comment on 
that? Or is feminism crucial to the revolution that you see? Yes. So, um, uh, in the case of Villa, women were uh, the, the, mostly the victims. And they were, as I said before, they were um, raped, right? That, that was a, sort of a, almost mandatory for guards to rape the women. Uh, but in the concentration camp, the reason why there were so many women is because they were sort of, they were the backbone of the, of the movement. And, um, you know, us, as you know, Latin American countries are uh, very, um, there's a lot of machismo, but women run the family and the country anyway. So we have that uh, complicated relationship with, uh, with gender. So um, when the dictatorship finally uh, arrived, the women were the, the first one to um, expose themselves to um, the violence of the regime, so they were uh, fearless. For example, since many wi uh, men died, women were the ones who led the, the, the search for the victims, for the bodies of the victims. And the same happened in Argentina as well. So women are um, sort of, um, they represent um, fearlessness and Continuity. Continuity, of course, yes. So, in that way, it's impossible to address these subjects ignoring the role of women. So, that's one of the reasons I usually write uh, about these issues from the point of view of women. And, um, but it's, um, it's complicated because um, you don't want to uh, misrepresent women and turn them into heroes. So you want to, to uh, be truthful and uh, sort of uh, present them in the whole, uh, as, as complicated uh, characters. For example, um, these women were raped, but they hide the fact that they, are, uh, that they had uh, daughters from rape. Uh, the president was raped or, or tortured, maybe raped, but she hides that fact. So I guess I am presenting the women as the strong women or uh, revolutionary women, women that they were, but I am also uh, presenting the problem, which is that uh, they cannot be open about the struggle that they, that they suffered or maybe their, the history, the history in their bodies. So, uh, yes. I, I have a kind of different question, more about the adaptations. How do you feel about the adaptations of your play? Do you just let go? Are there adaptations that you can really not take? Or how, how is that process? You mean when, when someone else works yeah. in my place? That never happens. Never happens. <laughs> <laughs> you also, you <laughs> No, I'm very selfish. No, but but now I think I'm going to be uh, more um, more open about that. I'm going to let other people work in my place. But oh, yeah? I'm usually yes. I mean, but at this point, never it never happens. Yeah, we are a couple, but I haven't seen them because they were far away in other countries. Really? Yeah, <coughs> they did December in, in Israel and they did uh, Eva in other countries. Yeah, but I'm usually very selfish. And also, some most people think that they are too local, so they are not really interested because of that. So I hope they are universal, but people don't seem to think yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a comment and, uh, and a couple of questions. I, I, my comment you may um, enjoy. I was, uh, the, I was in Chile during the earthquake, and one of the truths that you are saying that came and was that uh, uh, broke free, kind of, was the fact that um, relatives and friends who are very concerned about the big TV, the, what we call in Chile plasma. Mm -hmm. So I was terrified and I was still shaken by the fact that you know, the earthquake was very, very strong. It was like eight, 
seven point something. And but all that my relatives would talk about was is the class why it's big TV okay? <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? And I couldn't believe it because it was my first time in Chile for many years. And I was I encountered a different Chile that you know how we create a big country in our heads and then we go back and it's not Oh God. Uh, I, we are reminded why we left, kind of thing. But a question that I have, since when are you presenting your work in Chile? What year? I, I want to have a sense of how things are moving. Oh, mid-90s. The mid-90s, yes. Have you presented your work uh, in Villa Grimaldi, particularly uh, Villa? Yes. Okay. So yes. there are no politics of um, institutions that are saying to you, no, no. you can't represent you. No, no, no. You haven't encountered that. At yes. All. Were you able to, you didn't do it in the National Stadium, though, did you? No. no. And, and the other question is that um, in your approach to truth and justice, which I'm, I'm just um, I'm so pleased to, 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 to hear this, um, we at JMJ have the historical memory project that I direct and we speak about legacies instead of reconciliation. We can't, if we don't um, uh, discuss reconciliation without, without speaking about the legacy. Is that a movement that you, do you see yourself as a pioneer uh, in this kind of uh, theater? No, I don't think so. I think it has been a subject for uh, film and literature and theater for a long time now. So when the institutions fail, usually uh, theater um, follows up. And, takes the issues and makes something out of them. Problem is that sometimes after 20 years, it's only culture dealing with these issues and the institutions that keep failing, you, uh, you become impatient and you realize that it's, it's, a, it's a, the political system has to uh, be in charge ultimately. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a, a, a reflection, interesting reflection, but not, not a real change. Um, sure. Um, on, on, on vision discourse, so um, two, two questions. One is, uh, Gene had asked about why the two get staged together, and, I, and I, I think that got lost in the discussion, and I'd love to know that. And the second was, since you're so willing to make your audience uncomfortable, I wondered why uh, you chose the, the name Vija for it instead of like, Vija Grimaldi, which would kind of let them know what they were getting into. Was that a choice to like get the audience in the house before they knew completely what they were in for? Did you? So could you talk about those two points a little bit? Sure. Uh, the two plays are connected because I wrote this course of first, speech first, um, about, uh, about, um, about this president talking about her past as a, as a sort of a victim of torture, um, but um, I need more context for that. So that's the reason I, I, uh, I wrote Villa later. Yeah. However, they connected because she was detained not in any, in any other place, but in the Villa itself. Okay. So that's how they connect. And um, the title? I, I don't know, I have this thing about using just one word for the title. <laughs> so, I have to say yeah. it's refreshing. I, <laughs> but if you are from my country, I mean, I didn't intend this, this type of, uh, for the rest of the world, just for my local uh, theater community. If you hear the word, you know what it's, uh, what it's about. And that's very It's very, straight, it's it's very straight, straight, straightforward. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah. Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm so interested in Villan and in those, those three women being children of dictators, kind of literally. Yeah. And also having this position of being able to inherit mm -hmm. the land mm -hmm. and suggest what should come next. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you see yourself in that kind of connection. Um, and I, I connect that to the question of feminism too, um, somehow, but I'm not sure. That's my first question. My second question is about um, Escuela and the masked figures, because I grew up in the 80s, so I heard about gorillas mm -hmm. and saw these masked figures and had no idea what was going on um, when I was 12 and 13 years old watching the evening news and seeing these masked men that 
were called guerrillas in the United States. So I'm wondering why the facelessness there. They were always faceless for us. Okay, so, uh, uh, so when you grow up during the dictatorship, as I did in the 80s, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, uh, if you are protesting, marching on the street, people are going to take the pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, the police, police is going to uh, take pictures of you, mm -hmm. so you uh, cover your face. Mm -hmm. And um, if you belong to a left-wing organization, you also cover your face if, if you're in a meeting. Because if we belong to the same organization, um, and the police uh, take um, take Jean, they're going to torture her, and they're going to ask her about who is that person, and she's all, only going to know my name, which is not my real name, mm -hmm. and she's not going to even know my face. Mm -hmm. So it's um it's a secret within a secret within a secret. Mm -hmm. So In self preservation. Yes. Yes. So I was discussing uh, this uh, the other day uh, in a class. In my, in my, when you grow up in dictatorship, you're not supposed to um, say what you think. You never actually say it because you, you are taught that you are what you hear inside the house. You're not supposed to take with your class to talk about with your classmates. Uh, so you're not to, uh, supposed to talk about politics. So you you grow up. Um, silent about what you think. So you only talk about music or parties or whatever, sports. But when, it, when uh, the, po the politics issue comes up, you just make a joke or just don't address it. Because if you don't know if your neighbor or your uh, classmate or your dear friend, you don't know where does he come from politically. So I, after many, many years, in my mid-30s, I would just talk to my friend like, What's your politics again? Because it's a taboo, right? Um, so it's invisibility. And again, there's a second level of invisibility where you hide your ideas from people in your same uh, organization. So it's a double layer of invisibility. So I, uh, the problem with that is that that idea of invisibility um, stays within your body, your personality. So after democracy arrives, you keep being, dictatorship stays with you. So that's the reason why my plays are also, uh, I usually write, I don't write plays uh, with a climax in which the problem is resolved, but most of my climaxes are people finally speaking their minds. So that's the reason why I use a lot of uh, monologues at the end. So that's climax for me. When I say finally, what I really think, and so it's a, I come up as so a, a revelation. That's important. Yes, but um, I never, I, I the idea of um, I'm just not ready to show my face, literally speaking. No, the figurative is speaking. Is speaking. Yeah. I'm not supposed to show my face, mm -hmm. so that's the reason why I have the characters completely covered. And also because um, uh, I, I'm very interested in the fact that uh, people don't show their faces, and that's a common subject in every culture. For example, recently it happened with the, um, Pussy Riot in Russia, mm -hmm. where they have a, they did a concert with the faces covered, and they were detained and and they are still in prison, and th those are very urgent uh, issues. So the idea of covering your face appears uh, in history again and again, and for us, it means um, protection, protection, pr uh, protecting uh, your life by being completely secret, and also it's um, aggression because you are fighting the dictatorship. But also, it's um, the, the un unknown violent person and the one fighting on the streets. And it's very easy to condemn and to isolate the person who is fighting more radically. Uh, and you have an ambivalent feeling towards the person because he is fighting for a good cause, but you don't support his violence. So 
those are the problems raised by the by that, mm -hmm. and um, and also uh, it's just again it's challenging to see because it's kind of a negation of theater mm -hmm. because you're, you're negating the face and it's a struggle, and I like I like to explore that in theater. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, there was another question. I Did we get your question? About the women. Mm -hmm. Well, but related to feminism. Yeah, inheritance, and that you can. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I think, I think, um, since I grew up in dictatorship, I'm obliged. I'm, I have to tell the story to the younger generation, and I have to, um, and I have to remind people that, you know what? I didn't agree with this democracy in the first place, because <laughs> democracy without justice. Truth and justice is not real democracy. Mm -hmm. And also, if democracy, if if uh, something like justice or truth arrives thirty years later, it's not real just justice, because justice has to has to be um, um, timely. Otherwise, it's not justice. So um, uh, there's a. The inheritance means be the bearer of um, bad news, I guess, which is a very uncomfortable place. But uh, I still, I, I still think there's dignity in that. And uh, I have to say that um, in my country, again, all the people who, who worked uh, for uh, human rights doing the dictatorship are all women. But these are um, older women, and we have uh, yet yeah, another generation of women. But they are mostly working in uh, in the arts rather than in actual uh, direct fight for human rights. So I'm wondering, piggybacking off of the idea of making the audience uncomfortable, um, if when you're creating the work, um, if that's a common thing that you're, you're wanting to do. That's my first question and my second question is what um, playwrights would you say have influenced you or your ideas? I add sure. on something sure. here. With the uncomfortability, there was this great quote you had in the that note, there was a note of a profile of the published in the New York Times in the Sunday art section. And he said how upset he was when during one of the performances, I think it was of Neva in, Chile, in Santiago, when he saw two of Pinochet's friends walk out of the theater having seen his show in a good mood, mm. and how upset he was by that. I think that goes to some of the uncomfortable mm. question. Right? So, so I, I, I when that happened, I thought, well, I'm doing something wrong. So my next play <laughs> is going to be more radical. Yeah. So uh, eventually I, I, I ended up doing doing the play inside of the torture center, so they were not they didn't show up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, it, and of course, to go to a actual concentration camp to to see a show is really uncomfortable. So, I I don't want to. Um, uh, that's a, that's a delicate thing to create an uncomfortable play because. It's really easy to get um, to take a sort of a moral higher ground and to to preach uh, to, to, to punish the audience for not being um, for not being uh, pure enough, you know. So I and I also like theater a lot. So I I like um, to. Um, for, for my, my shows to be pleasurable as well. So, but for this, when, when I'm dealing with, with you, should, you should direct issues of uh, human rights, I like for plays to be um, unsettling because, again, to, to be committed to the, to the struggle for human rights, it can be, um, it could become, it can become, I guess, um, easy because you uh, position yourself in a really comfortable place of uh, being, again, being a victim. So I'm, I think I need to say this is, um, this is um, more complicated. Maybe you should feel a little bit uncomfortable because 
um, the democracy we so cherish is built on uh, injustice and unfairness. So in order to say those truths, you need to deal with some sort of a discomfort. So that's the purpose of it. The other question was influences? Yes. Um, I, I love, which, I mean, I, I, I'm not, it just influences, but it doesn't mean that I try to emulate them because I wouldn't, because they are too good for me. But um, I, I love um, Pinter or Beckett or Harry Turtle or um, Tony Kushner or, uh, yes, those. Tom Stoppard as well. I love um, uh, Wichner, a German. Yes. There was a question back. Oh, actually, um, go ahead, Shane, and then Seth, and then uh, uh, What's really struck me uh, is the idea of memory and secrecy, and it seems as though uh, Villa and Discorso uh, are very much actively working towards refusing uh, collective amnesia. Um, and I wonder if you agree with that, and then if so, how if you see that at work in your other plays that aren't necessarily expo literally exposing the secrets or having the president talk about her uh, for her past. How memory as, and, as um, resisting a collective amnesia? Yes. Were you talking about things that yes. don't? Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's, it's interesting because, OK, so right after the dictatorship, maybe a year, a year later, after the dictatorship was over, there was a truth, truth and reconciliation report. It was the beginning of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Report that worked for maybe four years, and then they, they presented a full report of uh, what happened during the dictatorship, a very complete report. It's very interesting because the name is, of course, very ambitious, right? Truth and Reconciliation. Um, and, uh, of course, we've had many of those in many different countries. And um, so you read, so they, they are basically, for each victim, there are a few paragraphs maybe two, where there, there's a description of um, what happened, how this person died, or who that, this person was. And it's really interesting because you read it, and you say, OK, this is the truth. And uh, now we can reconcile, right? But it's very complicated because there's those two paragraphs don't tell the truth. Right? The truth is something more complete, basically truth, a complete truth, because you don't get names of the, of the, of the officers who killed this, uh, innocent people. You don't get more information about who was responsible uh, for taking the political decisions for these people to get killed. It's just a blurb about this person was killed while he, while he was at home, I don't know, with his family. So the Truth and Reconciliation Report doesn't have a lot of truth. It doesn't have any justice at all. So, and then it's impossible to reconcile. Uh, so, that's a, a, a big, big disappointment. That's the reason why we don't like that report at all. In that report, you have, actually we had a second report on torture, which was as complete as that. So, in those reports, you get descriptions of actual torture, okay? So you get all that uh, described very specifically. And, and it's a really interesting to read. It's actually the most striking thing I've ever read in my life, actually. The description of, of torture, uh, as told by, their, by, 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 by the victims, right? Uh, so they inserted this thing in my body, they inserted this, this uh, um, animal in my body, whatever. You can imagine that, and, and it's even worse that, that you can imagine. So one of the things that, and I'm sorry for saying this, but I have to say it in this context. So one of the, the methods that they used was uh, uh, rape with, with dogs, OK? And these are, this is not casual. These are, they trained dogs for, uh, for, for rape, and that's what they did. So these uh, women in, uh, in the Villa Grimaldi were raped by dogs, uh, many of them. So um, that's in the report. The reports are public. So when we showed the, the play, uh, it was a big surprise because 
nobody knew about that. So a lot of people ask me, uh, are you making this up? This is, just, this is just too weird and this is unacceptable. Why are you saying this? Did you come up with this? Did you take this from Argentina or from some mm -hmm. other country? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and you they know did what? exchange information. You know what? This is in the actual report. Didn't you read it? Oh yeah, I heard about it, but I didn't read it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting how it works because you publish these big reports. You have hundreds of lawyers working on these reports. Nobody actually reads it, or maybe no. It doesn't. It doesn't sort of um, uh, permeate. I don't know, like mm -hmm. the, the society as a whole. So when you say this in, in theater a few years later, it it, it becomes um, news for a lot of people. So I when I wrote the play, I didn't think I was saying this uh, as a new thing. But after I showed it, I I thought. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I am denouncing something that I thought people knew, but they didn't. So I was reminded of a sort of a, the power of theater, which at least you are, um, I don't know, something about the information you give in theater that it's, um, it's like you hear it that you see it for the first time. I don't know, so I think that's, that's the, 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 the relationship with memory. I don't know if, if, if that mm, yeah. answers that. Um, I think we're out of, can we take a couple more questions? Is that all right? I, I think we have the room. I, I know that... Because uh, I know that you had your hand up and you had your hand up and there might have been one other over there. So let's, let's can we take a few more minutes? 6.15. Okay. Do you think so people have time so to go I, to dinner? I, I remember you said that, uh, I think if I, I, if I understood this right, that... Um, the, the, the plebiscite and the democracy doesn't constitute a form of justice because it's built upon uh, this uh, dictatorship, these lies, and this systematic torture and abuse of human beings. And uh, so the easy question would be, what then would constitute justice? But I also remember, I think, earlier in the talk, uh, there was a reference to the wounds of your generation. And it reminded me that uh, Malcolm X once said, you know, of the, the uh, Civil Rights Act in uh, 1965 in the United States, desegregation of the schools and things like that. Um, it's not enough to, uh, once you've stuck in the knife, it's not enough to pull it out. Because they were left with the wound. And so I'm just thinking these things too as we sit here and talk. How, uh, where, where do you if, you, if you think about healing, and then you think about the work that you're doing as a dramatist, do you see that your work is a part of the healing process, or is it too soon for that? Uh, so, when the dictatorship ended, the dictator didn't go out, didn't go home. No. He stayed for years and years, a decade actually, as a, as a senator for life, uh, non-elected. He was the head of the military forces. And head of the military forces. <laughs> so the dictatorship never actually ended, but it was a negotiation in which they said, okay, so, you, um, you don't uh, process our, uh, our, the members of the military, you, you, you don't uh, do justice, but you, we let you go. So for us, for people like, uh, like me who, who wanted truth and justice, the, the new democracy was a very unfair settlement and it was a big betrayal. So, most of the people in my country accepted the new terms. So they accepted this new democracy with all its uh, faults. So I and my, uh, many people like me became a minority, an angry minority, and, uh, and also a passive minority. And I, I feel very uh, betrayed by my country. And I feel, an, um, I feel like um, the, 
I feel like there's no redemption and there's no uh, healing. The healing is going to uh, arrive when my generation dies. Because we're never going to um, overcome the resentment of the anger that we have. What we can only aspire, I guess, to um, peace, which is different. Meaning that I'm not going to um, um, fight back with violent means against the perpetrators of the crimes. But um, I don't believe in healing and actually some, I feel like my, my, my theater is more an instigator of uh, anger than an instigator of uh, peace. However, however, uh, I, I, uh, sorry. No, it's okay. However, I, I, I think that um, in sharing this information with my fellow theater goers, goers the, people, the people who come to see my plays, there's a sort of healing, which is not healing proper, but it's a, a sense of, a, okay, I'm, I'm, in, uh, I'm a minority, but I'm not alone. There's, there's uh, uh, um, people who are feeling the same way. And that is uh, sort of a, a good, uh, a good, uh, a good sort of a idea, a good, a good place to be, which stands for healing, but it's not quite that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so my question is a little bit related to that. I was just wondering if you could comment a little more on the uh, generational conflict that you address in Class A. You mentioned that you see yourself in your role as reminding the youth, but at the same time, you also see the youth as being a bit more interested in just getting better education to get a good job. What do you think is responsible for the difference in perspectives between, uh, obviously there's many differences in perspectives between your generations and, and the younger generation, but do you see any forces at work? Oh, we didn't want to uh, sort of a uh, 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 sort of a uh, take over the government. We didn't know. Oh, we didn't want to see, only to see the dictatorship fall. We wanted a new system, political system, economic, economical system. But after the 80s and the early 90s, there was a consolidation of capitalism all around the world. So that became the, uh, the only system available for, uh, for, uh, in order to uh, govern, govern uh, countries and run economies all over the world. So there, there was a consolidation of capitalism as the only idea possible. So. Um, the new generation works within those uh, restraints, so to speak. So and they want they want they want social social justice. They want better education, but they don't want to uh, to impose a new system, society. So that's uh, uh, and that's the reason why I said it was pathetic because the dream of the previous generation, the one who wanted to to destroy the system as a whole. Uh, wants something from the new generation, something that the previous generation wasn't, was not able to accomplish themselves, but they want to impose those, those dreams on the, new, on the new generation. And the, the, the new generation, um, um, for the new generation, it's really hard to think of an alternative political and economical system because it's just uh, not an easy, uh, or visible alternative and in, in sight. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the reason why that it's pathetic and also because uh, it speaks of uh, the frustration of the previous generation. Are there any other um, questions? I thought I saw somebody back up there by Seth with a question. No? Okay. We'll let we'll let have Brian have another question. Sorry, right. I think we got three minutes. Um, <laughs> um, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'm just gonna do this one. 
Um, I, do you, how do you tend to choose your next project? I tend to choose it when, when um, so, so I think a lot about politics. So when, when something is uh, pressing or something is urgent, I try to make, um, to, to imagine a dramatic situation that can express uh, best that, that problem. So uh, it's a first, first on a, pol a political idea and then the, the drama. Yeah. But his place, it's, it's not that one is staged and it's gone. I mean, Bia and Discurso are playing in Buenos Aires this yeah. weekend yeah. and have been touring and Neva's playing here and then after here, it, this production is going to go to Boston and then he's going to direct another production with a different cast in Los Angeles in the summer. Yeah. In the summer. And also Villa is also coming to Los Angeles. And Villa's coming. Okay. So. okay, and so that production. So these are, even though they might have an inspiration at a certain very particular moment, they do seem to be continuing to move and, and you're still working on them. Yes. Okay, I think that we should end there. Thank you so much. Michelle.